Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. Um, tonight, we have some very special guests to start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. We have Mrs. Rads Willis's first grade class. So if we could all rise and join them as they lead us in the pledge. Okay, I think I forgot to call the meeting to order, so we'll call it to order now. And for roll call, I'd like to note that we have everybody here, and I'll apologize in advance, I lost my voice, so um, I'll try to make sure everybody can hear me tonight. Uh, I'd like to make an announcement. We did hold an executive session uh, tonight before the meeting to discuss a federal litigation case. Uh, moving into public comment, so I want to straighten us out here. I do have three, um, I have three requests for public comment tonight because we do have a group of uh, elementary school kids uh, waiting, to, waiting to participate in our meeting. I just want to be clear, if, if uh, anybody has public comment on an agenda item before we go into the meeting tonight, we can make that now. If it's for a non-agenda item that's not on tonight's agenda, we'll save that for the second public comment section, uh, if we could. So does anybody have uh, public comment, uh, either these three or anybody who hasn't given me a form uh, regarding an agenda item for tonight? Okay, thank you. So we will get to these um, as soon as we're done with the, uh, the regular business and our presentations from our elementary school students tonight. Okay, Mrs. Jones. <laughs> there we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to Ringing Rocks this evening. Uh, our families of first and second grade students, I thank you for bringing your children out so that they could help participate um, in our school board meeting this evening. I think it's a good learning opportunity for them and we're happy that they could be here. Tonight, school board members, we are just going to share with you um, a little bit about our SWIBIS program. We did this a few years ago, but we've made some nice enhancements to it since then and we've actually recently received state level recognition, so we wanted to make sure that you were aware of that and um, participate in that banner presentation. Uh, SWIBIS, or school-wide positive behavior, as you know, is our three-tiered system that we use to create a positive learning environment here at our school. We follow the Falcon 5, and our goal is to uh, make sure that we're teaching appropriate behavior in a preventative way so that our students can succeed socially, emotionally, academically now and as they go into um, the rest of their life. So some of the things that we do at our school, we do multiple things as part of our um, SWIBIS program, but I'm going to invite Mr. Weber's class to come up here to the middle, and I'm gonna turn the mic over to Mr. Weber, one of our second grade teachers. And then we'll have our first graders come back up. And our second graders are gonna come into the middle because they've actually added something quite special that we thought that the members of the board would enjoy seeing. Second graders, come this way. Why don't we 
face this way. And you back where you face that way. What my class is going to perform is our school pledge, Be Here and Be Ready. It's a pledge that all the students in our school make every day from the day they're in kindergarten in our school. And over the past few years, I've had my classes add movements to the pledge where we actually talked about what would be a good movement for these words or, or these words. So we actually came up with some movements to go along with our school pledge. Maybe Mr. Weber's back row can turn and face our school board. Families and school board members, as part of our morning routine, um, we say our school pledge each and every day to help us be here and be ready and prepare our minds for learning. Okay. At this time, I will just ask our, everyone to sit down, please, except for Jesse. Jesse's going to stay standing. First and second graders, please sit down. Thank you. And we're going we're gonna to give Jesse our attention. Thank you, Chance. And Chance is going to explain a little bit about our golden ticket system. But before, oh, sorry, Chance. It's Chance's birthday, <laughs> and he's joining us tonight. Um, sorry, Chance. Jesse's going to explain our golden ticket system. So, Jesse. for being here and listening and following all the rules and being safe. Board members, we are presenting you with a golden ticket. Go get So golden tickets are a key part of the uh, SWIBIS program. Students do earn golden tickets when uh, they're caught doing something good. So we want to thank you for the good you do here for the Potts Grove School District. So tonight you've earned your golden ticket. And if you would like to come back on Friday morning to sing the school song with us over the announcements, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> And at this time, um, I have Mrs. Rads Willis here. Mrs. Rads Willis leads our school-wide positive behavior team here at Ringing Rocks. And so she's going to speak just for a moment about the award that our school uh, just earned last spring, actually like the last day, the last day of school. So last spring, or last fall, we were approached to apply for this recognition. And 
the requirements for this recognition are a, we have state representatives from the school-wide system. They come out and they gather information through um, interviews with both staff and students. And they all, we also are um, required to perform a benchmarks of quality, which that is an evaluation tool that allows us to determine the strengths and weaknesses of our school-wide program. And then from there, you're able to make the changes or, or improvements that are needed. And we were able to do that. And in order to be recognized through the state, you need an 80%. And we scored a 93. <laughs> Girls, can you turn around and show the parents? Um, also this year, um, Lisa and I both have been invited to speak at the state represent, or to represent Ringing Rocks at the uh, State Implementers Forum, which is in May. So. Thank you, Mrs. Radswillis. So board members, um, since you earned your golden ticket, um, what we do every Friday morning here at our school, if you earned a golden ticket in school during the school week, on Friday morning, your name is called over the announcements because you're a golden ticket earner, and you're called to the office, and you help lead the school in the singing of our school song. So boys and girls, please stand up. And um, this evening, we have accompanying us Dr. Ramage, and I think um, it's important to know that Dr. Ramage actually wrote our school song many years ago. And when we started singing it, and it just kind of became our little tradition. And again, Mr. Weber's class, they, um, they are bringing some moves with them that they are happy to share with you. So boys and girls, first graders, you can face the audience. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to share our Swibus program with you. Families, again, thank you. Um, my families, um, we're going to take our students to the music room just for a brief little presentation for them. And um, you can pick them up there. So if you'd like to join me, join us in the music room, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Mrs. Jones, can I just say, Mrs. Jones, that every year I really look forward to our board meeting at Ringing Rocks. For two reasons, I think your PTA has some of the best bakers, and number two, your wonderful students in their presentation, so thank you. Okay. At this time, I will make a motion for us to approve 5.1 and 5.2, that is the uh, monthly board action minutes from the meetings held in September on 9-12 and 9-26. A motion and a second. Oh, <laughs> Rich voted from back there. <laughs> Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye.
I move that we accept the high school accounts, middle school accounts, and cafeteria accounts as presented. Second. Second. Yeah, second. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I, I move that we approve the payments of invoices in the amount of six million three hundred sixty-four thousand two hundred forty-five dollars and forty cents for September two thousand seventeen, as presented. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I move that we approve the treasurer's report for September 2017 as presented and file it for audit. Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Okay. Good evening. I'd like to move forward with the report of the superintendent. And I'd like to pass the mic to our student board reps, if I can, uh, Senior Mason McIntyre and Junior Savannah Lair, if you would, please. Um, tonight, just I'm just going to cover what has been going on in the high school and the middle school. Um, two weeks ago, the high school celebrated its homecoming activities, and on Thursday night was the bonfire, which was always fun for everybody. Um, and then on Friday was the homecoming game and the celebration of the homecoming court, so congratulations to all of those people. And Pottsgrove won 49-6 to against Pottstown in the game. Um, Tomorrow, PSATs will be taken by the sophomores and any freshmen or juniors that signed up for it. Um, the National Honor Society Blood Drive will be next week on the 19th. And the football team will be traveling to Phoenixville on Friday to try and continue their undefeated season. And in the middle school, the student government dance will be held on Friday, October 27th. And then I'm going to take over for the elementary school part and also a report out from, uh, we'll call it a student forum here at Ringing Rocks that we held, what was that, a week ago? About a week, a week or two ago. Um, so at West, uh, they started their healthy snack challenge last week where students were encouraged to bring a healthy snack every day. And then they can earn tickets to be entered into a prize drawing each week. Uh, the second graders uh, are finishing up their map testing this week. Uh, the Title I math and reading groups are up and running. And the trunk or treat is coming up before we know it, and that will be held on October 28th. And then for lower, um, I just said that, trunk or, that their trunk or treat will be held on October 22nd, weather permitting, but if not, um, then it will be held on the 29th. And then for Ringing Rocks, um, I just said talking with the second graders at Ringing Rocks uh, was very helpful. Uh, the students were quite insightful, and they taught me a lot um, about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis since I can't be there. Um, it's easier, much easier for like the high school, because, I mean, you know, me and Savannah go there, so we know. But it's, it's great to go and interview you know, a bunch of second graders. That was fun. Uh, so we had four questions, uh, 10 students, all second graders. Um, so the first question was, what are some great things about Ringing Rocks? Uh, the students had brought up art class and the works that uh, were displayed by the other students. They really enjoyed that. Uh, they enjoyed reading. Uh, their teachers, nice people, Mrs. Jones herself. Uh, math, um, <laughs> I said poor kids, because uh, I'm not a math guy. Uh, field day, and that there's, it's just a good environment with no bullying. Um, that's what they said for that. Uh, then they, the second question was, is there anything Ringing Rocks can do to improve the school or make it better? Uh, it was longer almost ev everything. Anything that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they wanted it to be longer and just keep on doing it. Whether that be recess, art, gym, encore pro uh, programs, computer lunch, um, and several even said, and they mentioned this twice, so I mentioned, I'm going to mention it twice uh, later on, that they wish that school could be longer because they enjoy it so much. Um, some students were interested um, in an encore program involving the sciences, and some students thought that it would be a good idea to, ha um, sorry, to have a water fountain outside. Um, so then what 
do you dream Ringing Rocks can become or can be? Uh, oh, a school with better bus behavior, they said. Uh, swimming with a swimming pool. Um, ah. not, not, not on the bus, but in the school. Um, bigger school, and not, they wanted a bigger school, but not for the reasons of more space, you know, newer stuff. They wanted a bigger school so that more kids could come and enjoy Ringing Rocks. That's what they said. Um, they wanted more, more classes. Some said field hockey. Some said uh, double recess. Seatbelts on the buses were brought up. Um, and these are second graders, by the way. They, they were just so insightful, and they just told us everything. Uh, again, they reiterated about staying in school longer. They wanted a longer library. Um, and then the final part was, what can you do to make Ringing Rocks a better place? So they said, dream, dream big, help people, practice reading more, be nicer to each other, and become better at math. And that's Ringing Rocks. Um. Wow, that was really uh, inspiring. If only we could just bottle up all that uh, second grade enthusiasm and uh, carry it forward all the way through. Savannah, I have a question for you. You mentioned the blood drive next week. Is that open to anybody or is it only for like staff and students? Um, it was only for students mostly. Like the students would come up to a table that the National Honor Society had set up at lunch and they would sign their name into like a Google Doc to get their names on the list and then they were given a permission slip to take home. Um, so it was just for students. The first 50 students that signed up are the ones that, that get their permission slips in are the ones that will give their blood. All right, thank you both for your report. Uh, just a question, is that is, uh, Mason and um, Savannah, is that something you plan to do throughout the same type of reports throughout the year for the rest of the buildings? Uh, yeah, so um, Dr. Ziegler, yes, Dr. Ziegler had made up a list of the different meetings that will, or like different uh, meetings that we'll be doing throughout the course of the year. Um, and most of them are scheduled to when we do the visits at that school. Um, and we'll be reporting out any time that we do a visit like that. Great. Makes, makes sense. All right. Thank you both again. One more thing real quick, Mason. I, I love that report, you guys. That was awesome. Mrs. Jones couldn't be in here, I don't think. If you haven't, maybe you could share the results with her, too. Yeah, she, um, so she was in on, on our meeting, and uh, me and Savannah both took notes, so she had uh, photocopied them. So she has them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to um, action items for personnel. I'm going to make a motion that we approve all action items for personnel. 10, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.9, 10.
Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Can we get a little description on what the soup club is? Um, yeah, it's an attachment. It's an, uh, this, this, sure, sure. This group is organized to raise awareness for L LGBTQ uh, issues, and they want to establish an activity fund that will allow this group to raise funds to support their cause. You bet. Sorry, anyone else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, two opposed, so uh, the motion carries seven to two. Seven to two. 11.4, budget transfers. We ask the board approve budget. So we have a motion and a second to combine 11.4 and 11.5, both for budget transfers. Do we have any questions or comments on these? Just a question. Um, <clears throat> a year or two ago, I had requested that um, we get more detail on the checks, which we're getting, which is perfect really wondering if we could uh, if it's not a lot of trouble um, we get the accounting uh, numbers where they're coming from is it possible without a lot of difficulty to just add a column or two columns I guess to see where what it's coming from and where it's going to I'm not looking to take you know add time but if it's a simple process if not I could look it up I guess but the you want a description help. of the accounts as a just the account what account it is yeah, okay if that's okay if nobody disagrees. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to action items number 12, education, measures of academic progress expansion to ninth and 10th grade. We ask the board to approve the purchase of measures of academic pro progress as submitted. So we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, two questions. Can we just get a reminder what um, the cost has been so far? I believe this cost is about 25000 if I remember correctly. But no, no, no sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I asked for clarification. You multiplied by 10. <laughs> multiplied. Yeah, you, it's much less. OK. Um, I opened this thing up early. I'll try to look at it real quick. But if we could get an idea, uh, Dave, if you know offhand, what we've spent so far or what the total would be, whatever is easier. Uh, and also, just a reminder, I don't, I don't know if, okay. Um, can we just get a reminder of what this is for, for the community's sake? Sure. Uh, the measures of academic progress, what we're, what we're looking for uh, is, um, you know, readiness in, in, in math and reading and in English skills. And uh, we, we went, last, last year, we committed to grades two through eight uh, for this process to basically uh, have an assessment program in place so that we could uh, make accurate um, you know, decisions, have the data, if you will, to make ac accurate decisions um, so that we could measure uh, students' uh, growth and also compare those students on a national basis, state and national basis with other testing. MAP, MAP is a norm test that, has, that ranges you know, across the state and it gives us an opportunity in our teachers to basically make real-time decisions on academic decisions for our students in K through eight. When we, when, we, when we did our data recognition period and our focus groups at the start of the school year, we noticed that we had holes in ninth and 10th grade because a lot of students, they don't, they take, the 10th graders take the PSATs and then they take the SATs, but we don't have the information that we need to basically carry them into their eighth grade to ninth grade year and have those ninth grade teachers be able to uh, chart their progress, if you will, and to be able to look at the growth that they've had in math and ELA and reading. So what this allows us to do is to continually um, have an assessment program that allows us to follow the progress of our, our students from grades through the t uh, two through ten. One of the things that we're saying, hanging on to a little bit is that in the future, if the state ever decides what they're going to do regarding uh, state testing, uh, the word on the street is PS, PSATs might be the baseline in 10th grade. 
So I can see us maybe, if that is the case, then we would then have um, the PSATs in 10th grade, which we currently have, but that would be the baseline, and that would be taken care of by the state as well as the SAT. So for us in the short term, we feel we can make the best decisions for our kids as they work their way into their, their, their high school career in grades 11 and 12, so we can place them best in uh, career readiness, course selection, and it allows our teachers to continue to monitor the progress and, and keep track. I, re I really think it's accountability uh, for our students and their families, but it also gives the teachers uh, a great tool to be able to come up with uh, instructional design that best suits individual kids. The concern I've had, I, I thought maybe I miss, was missing something. The current concern I had initially with MAP testing and continue to have is uh, <clears throat> if we're using this as a test to compare to national standards, as you mentioned, that seems to, to, to meet that need, right? Uh, if we're using it as a test to, um, I forget the exact term you, you, you kept using, but uh, to make academic decisions, I think you were saying, in the classroom, that is a concern because these aren't questions that the, either the teachers are creating based on what, you know, what they know they presented in the last week, two weeks, month, whatever they're assessing, or directly from the curriculum resources that they're using if they taught strictly to that resource and that resource uses a, an assessment, great. You know, it's, it speaks specific to what they're looking for and then they can decide accordingly, you know, make, like you're saying, make academic decisions, what needs to be retaught, what needs extra help, what needs this, what needs that. Um, so for 25,000, 26,000, I guess, uh, for another standardized test to compare ourselves to other schools, I like the idea of comparing ourselves. I'm not in, uh, interested in spending 26,000, uh, and I know a lot of that's already been spent. That's not what we're looking for tonight, is my understanding. But um, I just think it would be money better spent in other areas, encouraging the teachers to, you know, fo and I don't, I'm not saying you're not doing this, but focus on teacher-created assessments to see, or curriculum-based assessments to really see specifically, did they get that specific knowledge that I taught them, not that these, you know, norm questions. That's, well, that's I have a concern. couple of comments. Um, first, um, just to be clear, we discussed uh, this addition to MAP uh, uh, at length in the curriculum committee, and uh, the committee unanimously agreed that we were going to move this forward to the, uh, to the whole board. Um, the only thing we're voting on tonight is approximately 5,500 more dollars Less than 2, that, 2,200 less, because because by adding the the ninth and the tenth grade, uh, we got a discount on what we have already purchased through uh, through MAP. So um, so we're we're not talking about a huge additional spend. Although to your point, um, uh, we did previously commit to a larger spend for MAP. But um, you know, um, uh, I've had, a, I've had both the experience of uh, my son's view of uh, taking the MAP tests as well as uh, sitting through the curriculum meetings. And, and, and I think that, first of all, uh, uh, teacher-created assessments um, uh, are, in my opinion, not a really good idea. Um, it's, obviously, they do need to make assessments to get through their curriculum, but if you want to get a standardized score um, that actually has meaning across the building, then every teacher is going to do it differently. And, and if you try to unify it, it becomes a very complicated process. I know because uh, I'm married to a teacher and, and the district that she's in um, uh, has attempted to unify all their assessments. And it's not easy to do. It's a very time consuming thing. Um, and it's not a perfect thing. Um, uh, the, the thing that's good about MAP is that it's tailored to the specific student. They get a question wrong then it moves backwards um, uh, and, and it, it moves in this interactive way to level a student, I think, more effectively than anything else I've heard of that's out there. Um, and, and it's real time as opposed to all the other standardized tests because we're doing it three times a year. So we can make decisions on it during the year. Um, that we don't have the opportunity to do when we take the PSSAs or when we take the Keystones. Um, uh, so, in my opinion, uh, this is the best thing we've purchased uh, in order to have an, a real-time impact on how our students do throughout the year, even if the assessments are not 
created by our teachers um, and are not specifically tailored to our curriculum. Um, the fact is that, they, that they've got to be aligned to the, to the standards we use because everybody is using um, a, a version of the Common Core standards, uh, like them or not. Um, uh, and so it's not going to be hugely out of alignment for uh, per grade. Uh, I, the, the, the downside on all this is uh, is it's too new yet to say uh, that you know this has uh, been a stunning success for us. It's going to take some time for us to to be able to evaluate the impact of MAP. But and, and the other thing I like about it that I wanted to say to you, Bill, is uh, is the MAP test is very short. Unlike the PSAs, which are uh, uh, are like a two to three hour, pretty much use up the whole day, uh, multiple days uh, uh, thing. Um, the math map and the English map take 45 minutes um, each. So it's a total of an hour and a half, three times a year. It's not a big overwhelming uh, thing. And the kids aren't stressed about it, um, at least not the ones that I've spoken with. So those are all my reasons why I'm a big proponent of this and will be voting yes for this uh, addition for the ninth and 10th graders. And I have to say, I would be in complete agreement with you if it was this versus PSSA. I'd be all, I, I, you know, I'd be right there with you. Uh, as a standardized test, I think it does a great job for all the reasons you stated. Uh, but in regards to <clears throat> what we're looking for in regards to academic decisions, that's where I, you know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel either, like where you're saying the whole school should, you know, to, to try to unify all the teachers. I, I don't think that's wise either, unless you're looking for some sort of standardized thing year to year, right? Um, uh, and, and I'm not suggesting we do that, uh, try to unify tests uh, for this part. But uh, to use it as an academic or decision maker to, you know, as far as uh, for the teachers, that's just the, you know. So I don't disagree with you. I just disagree in regards to what we're using it for. Uh, just, just to clarify, make sure you understand, the way it works is that the teachers get, you know, this report that they can go in and see that this student is doing it, excelling here, but here a little bit weak. Maybe we can go in and tweak it. And you know what? These other students in this class are doing the same at the same level. I can work with them as a group now as a teacher, knowing that this is a weak part for them. Where the PSSATs are, here's your grade. Right. And you have no, there's no reaction to it. Right. You can't do it. So, I mean, that's why this allows them. I mean, the teacher feedback we have heard has been the really appreciated. So maybe that might be helpful for you if some of the teachers at some point came forth and you know, explained why they find it so useful. And um, you just reminded me also uh, another point I wanted to make is another thing that is different about MAP is that it works at all levels, uh, whereas naturally when we get our PSSA results, the focus is on the students who fall below the line in order to try and help them get above the line, which is a very important activity that we have to do as long as, uh, for a variety of reasons. But, um, but the map over time will give us uh, growth measurements at all levels. Um, and, you know, we had a big controversy a few years ago um, uh, in which uh, our gifted kids, uh, uh, we were told, weren't, growing, get, weren't achieving a full year's worth of growth. Um, and that was based on the PSSA scores. Um, uh, but, but the reality is that with MAP, we're going to be able to actually measure our students' growth uh, uh, across the board. And if our gifted kids are or are not growing, we're going to see that. And in the same with uh, everybody at all points in between. So I think that that's another big thing that, uh, that none of these other standardized tests give us, that over time is going to make a difference for us. Um, and hopefully put us ahead of the curve. Just to get back to Jim's question, um, as far as w what my point is, if this was replacing PSSA, if we were given that option, like I was saying, I'd be all for it for the reasons that you both described, um, and maybe more reasons, uh, be all for it. I'm against it and uh, in, in, in <clears throat> I'm against the investment we're making, have made really, and make continue to make in regards to using it as a uh, tool for teachers to make academic decisions in what needs to be taught and retaught. 
for example, like you were saying, it helps them see, okay, you know, we need to re go back to this type thing, or, you know, you're strong over here. Um, because the questions they're asking aren't, uh, the questions the MAP test is asking isn't specific to uh, what that teacher taught. The appropriate test to use for that, just in my own opinion, is either a teacher-created test based on whatever they taught during that unit or whatever, or if they stuck strictly to the curriculum, um, which would be fine, a curriculum-based you know, test that, again, was specific to the questions. So if this was to replace PSSA, I, I, I totally agree with both of you. But for what we're looking forward for, I don't. But that's Any other questions, comments? Annual cost grades two through ten over the next three years. The the quote is twenty, just under twenty six thousand dollars. Twenty two hundred dollar add on. Correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sure. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Moving moving on. Moving on to conference attendance, what's next for Apple Research Conference? We ask that the board approve the conference attendance for the item as submitted. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Yeah, just one small question in regards to not necessarily this conference or maybe this conference in particular. I understand we always look to all the conferences and get something back and stuff like that, but it just seems like it's an excessive $3,500 to send someone. Now it even says in here, I believe that uh, we're going to have either Dr. Ramage or Dr. Ziegler or both is going to be presenting at this particular conference. Correct. Well then why would we be paying 3500 if they're presenting, don't they pre usually with the presenter, doesn't they have to, don't they get like some type of discount or some type of payment for them to come? Not, not in this case. Actually, these, these three gentlemen, um, you know, uh, based on our, uh, our Apple research that we've done the, the past year um, and be a, dist a distinguished program, these three gentlemen uh, paid, paid their own way out there last, last year. Uh, I did not support that because I didn't know what it was going to bring back to us. Uh, so uh, um, I did not support uh, that coming to the board. They did that out of their own pocket to, 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 uh, to get out there and to start this program. And uh, what they brought back was um, this challenge-based learning that was brought to the academic committee. And it's another way for us to basically use, you know, use research and integrate technology into our classroom. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to, to share at a national level uh, put, really put us on a national level uh, with other schools. Uh, we went out there to observe other schools last year, and now it's our turn to come back and use our research study, which uh, these three gentlemen will be presenting to the uh, committee, uh, the, uh, ac the uh, curriculum committee in November to explain to you the different things that they've done in their res research uh, project and what they're taking back to, uh, to Apple in California. So, um, you know, for this time through, uh, they have particular money in their uh, in their budgets to handle this. Uh, they wanted to spend their money that way, and I thought it's going to help us to continually integrate technology into the classroom. Something that we want to we have a big investment as it is right now, and I wanted to make sure that we continue with that and uh, help our teachers get the most out of the technology we have in the district. So when you say they spent their own money last year, literally right out of their pocket or out of their own budget? Out of their pocket. Okay. Um, I, I'm sort of with, I'm with Al here where it, it, I hear you. I heard everything you said. Um, but I'm sorry, with the amount of money that Apple makes and the amount of money that Apple makes off of, of all the computers that they have in all the schools, um, and all the computers they sell because they have computers in the schools. Um, this should be really on them. And obviously you can't make that, that choice. Um, but, you know, this is promoting their product. That's why Apple's here. 
because they're promoting their product. Um, personally, I would rather see PCs in the school um, just because I, I see a lot of kids who go, I don't know how to do that because that's, I, if you have a Mac, I can do it for you, but I can't do it for you if it's on a PC. Um, and once they get out of school, you know, I'm sorry, I can't afford to buy my kids Macs when they go off to college. You know, they're going to be PC. So um, I just think this is a little much, and um, if they're presenting, it should be paid for by Apple and not by us. Typically. When you go to a conference uh, uh, as a presenter, even if the uh, even if they do pay your conference fee, um, they don't pay your transportation and lodging. And so my guess is that a lot, a, a good portion of the amount we're spending here is transportation and lodging. Um, I'm not saying I don't know whether the the conference fee is uh, being comped or not. Um, uh, or how much it is, but typically the larger cost is getting there and staying there, not uh, going. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, I, I would just, if, if we could just, uh, Dr. Ramage, obviously he's been part of this, this project since uh, last December. And uh, Dr. Ramage, maybe you can give the board a little bit more insight to what, what we're doing. Well, I, I wouldn't just clarify exactly uh, what Mr. Rabinowitz was, was stating. Because we're presenting, we're not paying any conference fees. I'm not aware of any fees that actually go to Apple they're providing training for us. They're providing the resources that we're allowed to use uh, through the What's Next is their research project. We, we chose challenge-based for engagement as our choice. It wasn't necessarily something we had to do, but they presented us a year ago with several options and helped us design. They provide uh, three different researchers who have not only supported us at the conference, but then throughout the year, we have them. We have them by phone. We can send information to them for analysis. Those are independent people from Boston University, Full Sail University, things like that. And up to 3,500 reflects, honestly, in part, just once those hurricanes hit, flights began to really skyrocket in terms of pricing. So all we're going we're gonna to share rooms, and we're going to take care of airfare and expenses to get to California. That's really the bulk of what that, uh, what that fee is about. It's not paying Apple uh, for the training and, and opportunities we'll receive. They are providing that for us because we're an Apple Distinguished Program. Only comment I wanted to ha say last is that since obviously you've got your per you know, seal of approval and says that I'll definitely vote yes, the only thing I would ask is I think in the past we have discussed prior, I think Bill, you're one of the ones that also brought it up in regards to sending so many people to a particular conference, as in, obviously we have some presenters, but do we really need to send two, three, four different individuals when it's such an expensive type of conference? That's the only thing I'd like the board, you know, the school district to consider in the future, as in if we're going to have a presenter, we have one or two, that's fine, but once you get to the third, now you're talking multiple rooms and multiple things. If we had two, we probably would have saved an extra $1,500 or so. It's just something I would think on big events, maybe limit the amount of people going. That's all. Just something to time with that, though. I've been to conferences where they were so large that even if you had two or three people, unless you know each one had to choose your own channel that you would go to while there, and then meet up and talk because you couldn't do it with one or two people. So that's just that may be the. Ca I have no idea if that's the case with this, but it is something to consider. So. I'd just like to chime in and congratulate the guys because I think this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, they earn this, and, and I'm really excited for you for this, and hopefully you'll be able to come back and share the highlights. But um, I think it's, a, it, it's wonderful that you had this opportunity. I really do. And I want to just uh, say I appreciate that you uh, folks uh, made the uh, decision to share rooms uh, in order to um, cut down on the costs, and hopefully you guys don't kill each other after a couple of days <laughs> we of uh, to return. staying we together. <laughs> Everybody bring your Breathe Right strips. I, I just want to echo what Patty said. Um, what a great honor and opportunity. I'm kind of jealous. I know it's going to be neat. Um, I'm anxious to hear what you guys bring back. and and tell us that you learned and, and to see it start to get 
you know, new things always being put in place to use the technology that we did make such a huge investment in. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. And, I, you know, again, I, I think it's time and money well spent in, in spreading it around the system. We can't be successful without principals who support what's going on, which Dr. Ziegler certainly does, and Tony does such an amazing job on the, the plumbing, as we would say, the, the infrastructure to make it happen, and obviously I'm, I'm interested more than ever on how globally, as a system, we're using technology for learning, and that's really the, the focus of the whole event, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramage. While I agree with Ashley's comment, PCs over Macs, in regards to this issue, um, I, I was kind of discouraged by your comment that you're going to be voting yes simply because the administration requests it, but um, I'll be voting no because I'm against three people going, not for the conference itself, but in regards to sending three people. That's the only reason I'm voting no. I just, I just want to, you know, I guess one of the things that I've experienced throughout my career is when you have an opportunity to send your people and recognize yourself nationally, uh, I, I, I think we need to do that. I think we need to be able to be known in the country at, um, you know, Corpertino, California, that Potch Grove, uh, has the uh, this Apple Distinguished Program, and we were selected to come out there and to, to uh, you know, give feedback on our research study and then be able to share that with the next round of Distinguished Apple Schools that will be coming in in December as well. So um, I, I, don't want us to, you know, I don't want us to ever you know, think, I, I want us to be a, a first class organization. I want us to be a district of choice, and this is what districts of choice do. They sell themselves and they market themselves at the highest level possible. And like I said, I'll start sort of where, I'll finish where I started, and that is, I, I did not support this financially. I wanted them to go and to prove that there was value in this for us. So they did that first. And when they came back and had the opportunity to share, not only with me, but with, uh, with our teachers and with the curriculum committee last month about what this is gonna look like as far as integrating technology into the classroom, I thought it's something that we want to continue to do and to use to our advantage so we can then be a school that people come to and we're looking at having people come to us now for areas of expertise and be able to, to market that. So um, I think it's a great honor. Uh, I hope we get the support because I think it's, it's well deserved uh, for us as a district and again, it makes us a district of choice and I think that that's something to be proud of. So uh, I hope that uh, we get the board support on this. And I do agree with selling ourselves. My only issue with it is I think we could sell ourselves with one person flying one person to California, not three. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries 7-2. We go to um, action items miscellaneous, uh, PSBA officer elections, and I'm going to turn it down to Mrs. Cherico. This uh, should actually be a little bit easier than what it might look like um, on your agenda here, because um, we really only need to vote on the president-elect and vice president. Um, the treasurer is running unopposed. Uh, the central at large representative, uh, we don't vote for that because uh, we are not in that uh, region and or at the western at large. We're not in either of those regions. So um, basically we're down to the president-elect uh, between David Hutchinson or Otto Voigt III. Um, so uh, both of those individuals have uh, been recommended I guess you might say by the um, Leadership Development Committee uh, of the PSBA. Uh, they've determined that both of those individuals are highly qualified. So um, just looking for direction if anyone has any feelings on either of those individuals. So. 
was the name of the uh, first Otto person? Otto Voigt, I think, was the one you Otto were... Voigt from Otto, Berks yeah. County. Okay, if I search for Otto, that should come right up. One would think. I meant to have this ready. Um, Otto is uh, in what uh, location? Muhlenberg, uh, Berks County. Right. And uh, David Hutchinson's from State College. Right. I think Santa that County. my uh, choice was uh, Otto. Um, he seemed like he had uh, um, a more extensive uh, list of uh, qualifications uh, dating back further. And, and so for me, that was uh, where I stood on on it i read everybody's biographies uh, th these are never easy choices because you don't get to you don't get to this point without being qualified right. so uh, i tend to try and favor the person closest to us because i think that they'll more um, accurately represent uh, southeastern pennsylvania's interests um, uh, as opposed to western pennsylvania's interests uh, which often differ when it comes to state politics as well as uh, educational matters in general. So where I had that distinction, that was where I made my uh, choice. And like I said, I think Otto was the person that I was gonna recommend to the rest of us. I don't know if anybody disagrees. The only comment I had was, and simply to reiterate what Rick said was, I can't tell, because I know none of these individuals, looking at their bio, I have no clue. The only thing I looked at was that Otto was from Berks County up in Muhlenberg, which is somewhat near our area. It has a demographic that's similar to our school district. And then you have, uh, my opinion, was Wolfgang, who was from the York County area. To me, I'm looking towards those as in they could represent better representation of our particular area and demographic of how we have versus some of the others, as I, as I don't know. Uh, individually any of these individuals so if anybody has a preference it's fine I was just looking at the ones that are nearest to us I apologize uh, is put a motion on the floor if you have a you can do that by slate if you also have a similar preference for if I can find a slate, slate that I sent out does anybody have or do we do we do we need to make a motion to have the vote or do we just need to I think you need to express your uh, vote by a motion Okay. I make a motion that we uh, cast our vote for uh, Otto Voigt, Otto Loving from Muhlenberg, and for Eric Wolfgang from Central Book. So we have a motion and a second for uh, to cast our votes for Otto Voigt and Eric Wolfgang. Anybody have any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. So, oh. we have four committee meeting minutes to approve to, or to accept tonight and none to report out on. So, I'm just going to make a motion that we accept 14.1 through 14.4, which is the minutes for the ops and facilities policy, athletics and co-curricular, and curriculum technology student affairs committee meetings that took place. Thanks. <laughs> Motion and a second. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay, we're on to new business. Does anybody have any new business at this time? just wanted to make a quick comment um, the um, at the, the football game last week against Upper Park which obviously you have you know experience with <laughs> um, our student section leader went over to Upper Perks student section to just try to talk to them and um, they threw a rock at him and it hit him in the face so um, apparently he came back with a, yeah, it got really close to his eye. He came back with a red mark and which then turned into a bruise. So I don't know if you would just want to sort of pass that along to somebody at Upper Perk. Um, 
I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I didn't, you know. But I, I no one deserves to have a rock thrown at them. So, Ms. Kutch, do you know if that was like reported to Mr. Dorenzo or Dr. Ziegler? Or, I have no idea. Or for the football I, coach, it was, or it was reported back to cheer, me. Cheerleader coach or anybody? It okay. was just reported back to me because my daughter was there and she was in Ma the student section. Mason's advantage. You hear anything along these lines? Yeah, I was. I was there. I wasn't there with him when it ha when it happened, but he went over with. Like, it was there was only like 12 students from Postgrove at that game, and can, most can of them I interrupt went for over. a second? If this it sounds like might involve specific students, maybe we can have an offline discussion. There won't be any names. Just just to. Okay. Yeah, why don't you just look into it, Bill? Yeah, I, I was just curious. I was just curious to see if either, obviously, our student leaders, I just want to know if they, maybe they were there, you were. So we, we can have that discussion, and I can follow up with uh, our administration as well as Upper Perks administration. So thank you. And if I could just piggyback on that real quick. Uh, to everybody out there, if you hear anything, immediately get a hold of the administration. If you hear of anything that's causing harm to our students, home or away, because here we are, we're like how many days away? Like that's. You know, now now they're just finding out. So um, if you ever hear anything, go directly to the source. They're here to help you. I just wanted to put a little plug out there for upcoming Friday's football match is going to be against uh, Pope John Paul. It's going to be a very big match. I think we're both still undefeated. Obviously, this match could be deciding as in dough placement, obviously, for playoffs and such. So we want to have everybody there as possible. Uh, the other shout out I'm going to put out is it's also pink out night, as in what we're going to be celebrating our pink out night and our senior night. Uh, if you go on your Pottsgrove boosters page, which is through your athletic page, you can get your uh, pink out t-shirts. All proceeds go to our local Phoenixville Cancer Center. So everything that's sold for those shirts stays here locally at our Phoenixville. So if anybody wants to get those shirts, they're online. Uh, and I just want to make sure we get everybody out there for the game. It's October 20th, Friday night, obviously here. Next Friday. Next Friday. Next Friday. October 20th. Friday, October 20th. Um, just one thing I'd like to add to that, um, the Phoenixville, um, who I'm eight years cancer free this month, um, which is a big milestone, but that fund actually is for patients only. It, it is not for research. It is for whether they need gas to go back and forth to treatment, whether they need um, groceries, if they have medications. Um, a lot of medications, they cannot um, afford the side effects medications. So I can guarantee that money, I try not to get too emotional about it, but we take the soccer team, we actually have our friends helping friends, it'll be the, the seventh year that the uh, soccer team um, will have it this Saturday. We combined all the funds together, we go down to the, to the cancer center, we get a tour, we get to see the people that it helps, and we, the kids get an explanation, and it's just a beautiful thing. So I just want everybody to know it's such a beautiful thing because it goes directly to the patients who need it now, not research. It's, you know, but, um, and I thank you so much for the Booster Club for what you do for them. Uh, I have one thing in regards to the facilities uh, policy that was most recently uh, approved, but now the, we've decided to go back and review it. Uh, because of that, um, I'm going to recommend and, and make a motion in a minute that we temporarily suspend the current policy until it can be reviewed uh, and in the meantime go back to the original policy. Uh, if that doesn't cause too much logistical nightmare, I'll look to, to Dave and Bill for that. Uh, and then when the policy committee reviews the, the, the current facilities policy, to whatever we come up with, not implement it until the following school year to give the groups enough time. So with that said, um, go ahead. If you're, I can't stop you from making a motion, but if you're going to make a motion, I just ask, I want to remind that a lot more went into that policy than just the use of facilities fees that are causing the trouble. 
So my request would be if you're going to make a motion that we just make a motion to suspend the fees, not the policy. Okay. Will there be any fees in the interim? Well, then we can speak to that before. I would say make the motion and then have the discussion. Mm -hmm. we can go to these two. When, uh, did you, you haven't made the motion yet, so we can still talk about it, right? Um, well, or before, um, I, um, as uh, as we've discussed previously, I'm troubled about uh, uh, about the way, some of the aspects of uh, how this policy has been implemented, and um, we may even hear from somebody uh, when we open up public comment. Uh, um, you know, we've had discussions with some of the PTAs, with the Girl Scouts, and 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 I don't want to. Char I, I think we I think we need to be cognizant of the issues, but to, to undo all the work related to the policy also feels wrong. I mean, I liked that we were going to send it back to committee and and refine what was done, so that so that it works for everybody in the district and also looks out for the district's interests, which are important as well. Um, I'm pretty torn about uh, about voting on a motion right now, Bill. Um, uh, you know, of course, you, if you make it, I will. Um, uh, but but it's uh, I, I don't feel like I have enough information to make a good decision, which is something that uh, I hear you say sometimes, and uh, that's the way I feel right now no, that, about this. And that's a good point. My concern, um, and maybe there's a better way to go about doing it. My concern is because. The implementation wasn't what any of us, I think, is safe to say, expected. There's groups being negatively affected, which I hate to, you know, we do, I agree with what you're saying, we need to take time and make sure we do it right, you know. Uh, is there a way to allow these groups to use the facilities that were using them prior? With, I don't want to be changing things that we like, but you know, just until we can, I don't even know how I'm going to vote on the policy itself, but since we're re-looking at it, you know, I'm just thinking, can we go back to what it was prior, keep that for the year, you know, change our policy, implement it in the fall to give the groups enough time. So if that's a matter of just saying, hey, waive the fees for now, I, I, I don't know. I'm open to whatever. I just want to give some relief to the groups that are negatively affected. Not sure exactly. You know, obviously, I don't get the community input that you do, so I'm not quite sure I understand exactly what the issue. Obviously, there's a backstory to this, and, and you do as you as you wish. But I don't think you want to totally suspend the fees. I presume you still want some fees while you revisit the fee schedule. I, you know, I, I again, I don't have the backstory, but to suspend fees. Uh, means that for some period of time we're going to absorb a fairly significant cost where you had a fee schedule and maybe you want to go back to that. I, I'm not quite sure. And that's but, what I'm saying, to go back to what well, was. How, how about just making a motion to suspend the fees for the Girl Scouts for now and then deal with uh, other issues uh, on a uh, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis until we finish redoing the policy? And I don't know if we need a motion or not, but I think we just, I mean, uh, my I, I would be more comfortable if you had a pre-existing fee schedule to go back to that. I, I'm, Rick, I'm a little uncomfortable sorting out one entity because that gives me, a, you can imagine, some angst for a whole lot of legal reasons. That's why we hire you. Um, but, but, but in this case, uh, uh, we, we sort of uh, inadvertently um, from the public comment that we had at the last meeting and from follow-up communications. We pulled the rug out from under a very important program to the Pottsgrove School District that's largely made up of Pottsgrove students. And, by the way, that also does a lot of community service for us that, uh, that uh, could be... Uh, is there a category... Again, I don't have the... Back, is there a category that's being affected, a subcategory that may only be this group but maybe others? Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just know that uh, that we've got a problem. Uh, we've got a group that hasn't been able to meet that it, that does service to us that we don't compute an imputed value to, but there is a value to. Um, uh, so, you know, me, I, I just want to address it. Um, uh, you know, 
I, I don't know how to address it. I don't need a motion to address uh, it. I just want it addressed. Do, do they come, I mean, are, can you help me here in terms of what um, part of the umbrella they come under? Um, first off, I guess in either our pre-existing policy or the current policy, uh, we granted uh, certain preferences to nonprofit community groups serving the Potts Grove School District. Um, so there are there are different fee structures related to that. Um, with respect to the the, uh, the Girl Scouts not being able to meet, I did have a conversation with the representative following our last board meeting. Uh, invited them in, told them we'd figure out how or if there was going to be any fees as we went forward, but invited them in and asked them to come. And we sent out all the approvals for all the requests. I didn't check and see if they're actually coming. I, I apologize for that. Um, we'll, we'll do the board's will, but there are groups that have paid. There are groups that haven't paid. There, so there'll be, if we waive the fee, I think we have to waive it uni uniformly across the board. And I'll be re cutting refund checks for those who have, contrib who have uh, uh, voluntarily complied with the, the fee structure. Um, or we can review the fee structure and we can adjust fees later uh, based on whatever changes we decide, we deem are appropriate in the fee fee scale uh, I think we can do either I just I'm in favor I mean this is me I'm in favor of the second but I I'm very concerned with any organization <clears throat> especially organizations that serve our children being restricted from using the facilities in the meantime so we know from the conversation we had in the last meeting that there are organizations who operate as a nonprofit and they have to have a zero budget at the end of their fiscal year and, and so they need time to plan. Um, they need help to understand what in-kind contributions mean and the like so that they can have this opportunity to plan to meet those requirements. In the meantime, they can't, we can't not allow them, I don't know how to say this right. We can't prohibit them, we don't wanna prohibit them from holding their meetings or their functions in our facility where they've relied on us to be able to do that for so many years at no cost. I think I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different groups and most of them are fairly understanding of the that we have to make this progress and that there's that there's going to be fees attached um, at some point and, and they're they're fairly low but they they need to have the opportunity to plan and understand and I mean I how about I we do this? How about we, uh, <clears throat> that we give the administration a directive uh, that uh, folks that indicate nonprofits that this is a hardship, that we will not collect the fees currently until we sort this out going forward, and that we will, they need to understand that there will be a fee, and that anybody that's negatively affected the other way with the understanding will ultimately issue a credit. I, 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 Dave, I don't. You know, I'm on your side. I, I'm not the business manager, but I don't think we want to be cutting and calculating checks. But as we work it out, we'll give a credit going forward because we have to be fair to everybody, all the nonprofits. But so right now, if if there's a hardship for somebody, uh, we'll uh, work with them. Um, and I would request respectfully that um, I guess this is the policy committee that it's jurisdiction that I can you know I can't make you come out, but I'd urge you to sort of deal with this as soon as possible, uh, hopefully schedule a special meeting with this as the only agenda item. Let's try to get this resolved before we compound our problem of credits and other people coming forward. Uh, let's try to clean it up as soon as possible. In the meantime, we can let the Girl Scouts meet. Okay. Second. Do we need a motion? Is that a That was my question, is if we can give that directive, which I thought we did at the last meeting. I if we could just make it clear this time that we don't want to we don't want to prevent any organizations that were previously using especially the the, the not-for-profits that are serving the kids from having their meetings until we can get it sorted um, mr. Alexander what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll work with this with mr. Nestor and uh, mr. Dorenzo to make sure that 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 gets all sorted through 
until it gets worked out in policy committee. Okay. Mark, since that's going against a policy, do we need a motion and a vote or no? My view is we're not, we're not going against the policy. We're simply acknowledging a hardship until we can work with them on payment. It would be a little bit, I, I guess, an example would be that, uh, you know, I'm sure it happens. Some youngster comes in and doesn't have their lunch money. You know, we let them come in later in the week and pay it. I knew we were going to talk about it. Thank you for bringing it up. Yep. And you can save some public comment. Me. Is that it for new business? Okay, so we're going to move on to answers to previous inquiries and then public comment, I promise. Um, we just had one uh, previous inquiry that we need to cover. Yeah, I, I just want to ask the board. Obviously, you had an opportunity to uh, the uh, question was, was regarding uh, KI and potassium iodide uh, was brought up by uh, Mr. Parker, and I had an opportunity to research that a little bit. We had a chance to work with the uh, Limerick Emergency Management Committee in preparation for our drill in November and uh, got some, some of their thoughts and expertise as well as our own school nurses and the school nurses from other districts. So um, I just that's the information that I have for you and the reasons at this point that we're, why we're not recommending that particular piece at this time. Um, so if there's any, any more questions, I can look into them for you. Um, be happy to do that. But I think that, uh, you know, an, an issue like Limerick that does occur, it's a very slow pro Our drill might be two to four hours long. But if anything would escalate to the point of any type of radioactive leak, it could take days and weeks, and we would all be out of the area by the time that, that, ever, that ever occurred. And that was pretty much the message that was brought, brought by our emergency management specialist that came, came to visit. So uh, I share that with you um, as uh, just, just more information. Okay, uh, moving on to public comment. Thank you, Dr. Shirk, for that update, by the way. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my voice is failing me. <clears throat> okay, um, first we have uh, Shelly Stockmall from the Girl Scouts uh, Manitani Service Unit. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Man, thanks. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, thank you so much for having us. I'm here to find solutions. I'm not here to place blame. Personally, um, I was never welcome to come in. That's all I've been asking for for over six weeks is to have some sort of meeting on the value of what we bring to Pottsgrove. You said you want to be the um, you know, school district of choice. We had Girl Scouts in here tonight performing. Um, you said that they want to have you know, more, 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 right? And this is what we provide them as a Girl Scout organization. We are the premier leadership Girls, girls leadership in the world, right? So by the time they hit high school, they've got business acumen, they're developing leadership skills. It's a staged program to grow them. Every female astronaut that has been to space has been a Girl Scout. More than 50% of um, our government, uh, governors, uh, you know, U.S. representatives, senators, ha women have been Girl Scouts. This is a, a very well-known, statistically-driven program that we're involved in, and we're volunteers. Um, and I actually brought a Girl Scout with me today. Um, if you could stand up, this is Macy Long. She is a 12th grader at Pottsgrove. She recently got her gold award. And this is the part that I'm really not understanding, is that when a girl gets her gold award, she has to go through a very rigorous process that is approved by the Girl Scout Council. She has to come up with a business plan, a budget. She needs to be able to do these things. She needs to run a program, which she did at West Pottsgrove. She gave over 80 hours of her time. She ran a team of more than five other people. Um, it was a STEM program, which apparently the, um, some people in the school district are applying for a grant now to be able to continue, which is wonderful. She does all of this, um, and what happens is 
is that people in academia, they understand the value of this, right? So she has colleges salivating. She wants to go to school for biochemical engineering. She has people, uh, colleges salivating for her to apply there. And Girl Scouts who get their gold award, it's very similar to the Eagle Award in Boy Scouts. A lot of people are familiar with that. Um, so they get lots of scholarships. But in addition to scholarships, I have a friend who has her gold award. She went to Brown University. It's an Ivy League school. And she said to the administration, um, the registration director, how much did that matter that I had my gold award? And the, the person at Brown said, well, we will take people who have lower SAT scores that have their gold award than over people who have higher SAT scores. And the reason why is because, and it's a statistical fact, they make better alumni and they're more likely to finish college because they've proven themselves. So if Brown wants girls who have their gold award, Penn State does the same thing. I talked to the, the registrar over there. He said they put uh, Eagle Scouts and Gold Award applications, when they have those on their college applications, he puts them in a separate pile. The military, if you have your Gold Award or you have your Eagle Scout Award, you go in a, a rank ahead of anybody else who is enlisting. So I'm really, uh, I understand that maybe not everybody understands those things, and I'm hoping that maybe we can look at scouts in a different way at Potts Grove, and we should be encouraging these students to stay in scouts, to earn these awards, to do these things, and that scouts is not penalized because we meet in the building. I've been meeting at the uh, music room over at West Potts Grove for years. I appreciate that. I've been meeting for free. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. We're there when Tony, the janitor, is there. We don't leave a mess for her. She's there anyway. We're not asking for extra lighting or heat or anything. They're there. Um, we have a very great relationship with everybody over at West Potts Grove. And because we, we really care, you know, we've provided a program. Another girl in my troop provided a program that Mrs. Kohler had requested to help incoming kindergarten students prep for kindergarten. Um, not academically, but day structure stuff, right? So it's very specific things that we've done to give back. And it just, it really um, is shocking to me that I've been requesting this meeting for six weeks just to have this opportunity. And I thank you for listening to me tonight to uh, discuss what the value is in scouting and how this, this cost is such a hardship um, for these girls to be able to, and especially as girls get older, you know, the Daisy and Brownie troops, when they're young, are big. But I've got six girls in my troop. All six of them are going to get their gold award. They're amazing, amazing young women. But for them to be able to split the $150 with all the other programs and activities, and these projects cost money, too, to, to be able to run, it is a hardship. So as you go back, and I appreciate you, you know, trying to, to get a, a grace period, on, on the policy, and I understand your point of not, you know, um, being able to do that, and that a lot went into the policy. But I'm just hoping that going forward, when you rewrite the policy, that you do consider the value that scouting brings to Potts Grove. Well, I also wanted to say that I also made the point that I don't, uh, that I want you folks to be able to meet, and and that I do see the value in the scouts, um, and um, regret that we. Um, made decisions that caused hardship for uh, for your organization for all the reasons that that you said it um, uh, so uh, eloquently just now so my I think we already agreed that uh, that well did, did you agree though that we could meet for a time period but at some point a fee is going to be assessed we're, we're going to revisit the policy um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the policy still stands for now. Um, uh, I can tell you that, that in my personal opinion, the service that you folks do for our school districts, such as the ones that you laid out, have value. Um, I, I don't know how we're going to compute that value, but, uh, but my hope is that even if we didn't change the policy as it exists now, that the value would uh, negate whatever costs might occur um, I can't say that with certainty. I can't uh, write the policy as I'm talking to you t here today. I could just give you that my personal opinion is that it should be that way. 
Um, and I'm one of the three people on the policy committee, but not the I, only one. I would like to. I would like. I, uh, you know, what I've heard here tonight, and, and I appreciate your passion, um, and I can't walk in your shoes, um, but we have to treat everybody equally. Right now, for the moment, you've gotten what you need. We're not going to collect the fees from you. But let me finish, please. Uh, but you need to understand that we don't want to make a knee-jerk decision till we study it because we have to treat everyone fairly. And unfortunately, we're not in a position, nor should we be in a position to judge who uses more light or less light or who may put a great burden on the building. You know, the policy has to be applied uniformly. We can make categories such as nonprofits. We can favor groups, in my opinion, that are community-based and are majority of our students. And I think if you just give the board a little bit of time, they're going to try to ameliorate this issue. I mean, you just have to give them a chance because apparently there was an inadvertent um, a policy written that may have had a, an inadvertent consequence. I don't know, but that's what I'm hearing. So just give us a little bit of time to try to straighten it out. Thank you, sir. I'm not sure if you were at the last meeting. When I spoke and asked for and asked for and the meeting, I don't meeting, watch the meetings on TV. Uh, I, that's fine, um, but I just want to put out there that I did have a conversation, but we still requested a meeting. And um, when I was sitting here, as most of you saw, who were facing me, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Girl Scout law, but we're all about honesty and fair, um, which I know you guys are also, because I heard what Ring and Rocks performed earlier who I am so proud to say my Girl Scouts were in there because I love them very much. However, what I heard tonight coming out of the mouth was not honest and fair. And I am a Pottsgrove alumni, and I feel like we are being treated horribly, and this is not why I would want, how I would want Pottsgrove to display. And I'm sorry, I am so emotional. Please don't take that. Now let me suggest to you that, that we try to move forward that Dr. Shirk will be glad to take your name and you're welcome to attend the policy committee meeting when they address this. That That is my question. When is that? And my We're going to set a meeting. Is, and when can we meet with a policy, not just with more, with a panel and not just one person? Policy committee is of three people and you'll meet with those folks. They open it up to the public. It's not dissimilar to what's happening here, but there are certain things that we address in a committee forum because, frankly, there's a lot of folks when we get to this level that may not have an interest in an issue that doesn't affect them. So we try to deal with these issues in committee. Uh, you know, I don't know what you've taken umbrage with, and I don't choose to debate that. I ask you, let's go forward, and we'll deal with it at the policy committee. So our policy committee meeting, there. First, the regular policy committee meetings are the dates are posted on the <clears throat> on the website, and we have one once a month. This one, it looks like we're we're leaning towards a special meeting where we only address this issue, and we can make you well. We'll make a public announcement, but I will make sure because I have your contact information that you're made aware. Just so you know that these committee meetings are a lot more interactive. We don't have, you know, you get your five minutes of public comment. They're, they're, they're made to be a smaller group so that they can be more interactive and we can peel back more layers when we need to. So I'll make sure that you're aware when that meeting's going to happen so that you can ask all the questions you need to. I appreciate that very much. And, and, I, and we do take, I mean, the, the I policy committee, it's not, we messed up, right? We, we rolled it out in a, a way, you know, we didn't get, we didn't get, we didn't consider the fact that you need fair warning and, and to let people know that these things are coming. We thought a lot about the policy. I think it was in committee for a year almost, and there were things we didn't think of. Um, we'll appreciate you having you and anybody else there to, to remind us of the things that we're not thinking of when we, when we take another look. So I promise that you'll be invited. I appreciate that very much. And just one last thing before you go. Before you leave, Mrs. Bicker, my, my secretary's behind you there. If you could just give her your name and, and address and contact numbers for me. That, that'll help me moving forward as well. Thank you. I really, really appreciate everybody's time and consideration. I hope that that comes through. I, I, you know, I know it's an uncomfortable situation, but like, I really appreciate you going back and reconsidering for us. It, it really means a lot to me. Thank you.
Okay, I have Melissa Haynes. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure I've known many, many of you on the Facebook page for the district. Um, I'm the one who started, if any parents are here for my um, comments, thank you. There have been a number of issues on the bus, specifically my son's bus. The, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Pleasant View Road. We live at the corner of Pleasant View and Sanatoga. Yesterday, the sub dropped them off at the top of the hill of the S-curve instead of turning on to Sanatoga Road. I walked a third grader home that lives down past Ron's Crooked Hell Tavern. The bus driver then turned around somewhere and drove past us. That is completely unsafe. I had a woman contact me today saying her son had a knife pulled on him on a van. She went to the police and made a statement because there was no guarantee that the other student who pulled that knife on her, student, on her son would be removed from the bus. My bus, I know that there's issues with CMD and bus drivers, but in the past four weeks, there have been seven different bus drivers between four different buses for bus 28. And it was made clear tonight that you guys want to be the, one of the best school districts. Well, if our kids aren't safe on the bus, where are they gonna be safe at? Because I have other parents telling me that when they go to CMD, CMD says it's the school's fault. When they go to the school, the school says, when they're off these premises, it's CMDs. Well, obviously there's conflict somewhere, and this needs to be addressed. I, I do have other parents' um, comments, I'm sure many of you read. There was a little girl who was sexually harassed on one of the buses, and the other student was not pulled off the buses. It was made aware that that student was moved to a different bus. That's unacceptable. That is completely unacceptable. I put my faith and trust in this school district to send my kids here. I have two boys who go to this school and I am scared to death now to let them get on the bus and come to school. And that's not right. My, our taxes are one of the highest amounts in the state. And for me to be scared to death to send my kids to school is ridiculous. So I would be happy to sit down. I don't know what the agenda would be for that. I, this is my first school board meeting, so I don't know how this um, goes. I did email Mr. Nestor, and he did tell me that it was his impression that there was a bus driver that was going to be on bus 28 for the mornings. After that, there was a different sub every morning. Um, I know my husband spoke with Brian yesterday after the bus driver let these kids off down the road, which, by the way, the bus let them off had the aide get out of the bus, walk around, and walk up to the corner while stopping traffic while cars were going around and just turning on Sanatoga Road while kids are trying to cross the street. That shouldn't have happened. They have a bus stop for a reason. This is 2017. That is, I mean, you guys know, that's a very unsafe, yeah, it was rainy yesterday morning, so the roads were still slippery, and you're gonna have kindergartners through fifth graders get off the bus and walk over a half a mile home if this was your kids, I don't think you would want that either. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I know, I don't know what the protocol is about me responding to public comment or any of us actually responding to public comment, but I definitely feel that this warrants response. Um, I've seen, I've called attention to the Facebook strings and I went and I read them um, some cons the, I'd say the main concern that arose for me, by the way, I agree, if any of those things happened, I have a second grader that rides and I have a middle schooler and a high schooler that ride too. So um, I would share all the same concerns. We've been blessed with a great bus driver uh, for many years for my elementary school student. She does a great job. Um, but. These concerns are valid, and I saw a ton of comments about, we'll talk to CMD, we'll talk to Mr. Nestor. I think we need to let everybody know what, 
who to call. So for me, I would call building principal, and I have called building principals about issues on the bus, and they've straightened them out in a snap. And I'll say, even before I was on the school board, they got straightened out very quickly. Um, that's where I would first think to go. But I think that there's a lot of misinformation floating around on social media. I don't even know where's the right place to go. I think these these prob these issues are happening. I mean, uh, and it's not you know your one bus experience. There's been a few other bus experiences that I've heard about from parents or or seen out there. So I think w one of the concerns for me has been, and, and I hope we can do this, is to get information out to everybody to say this this is how to get the problem or, or an issue or a concern addressed quickly. I'm sure, you know, from, from my experience, I know if I contact a building principal and they need to go higher, they will immediately take it as high as they need to go. They have the experience to know who they need to talk to to get things done. Um, but I don't, I don't even know the best thing to do, and I have three kids that ride the bus every day, so I think it would be important for us. We do have issues. To, to be addressed, and I know some of the issues that you mentioned today have been addressed. Um, but what's the what's the right way to get it done, best and fastest? Um, sometimes I feel like uh, I'll see comments about buses being late, and then I find out, well, yeah, the bus driver had to pull over to address behavior issues, um, but they're on the hot seat for being. 10 minutes late, and, and uh, then on the other hand, if they if they just try to expedite the route and they don't deal with these issues, there's you know if there's kids standing up or all the way to uh, you know the mistake that happened maybe because of rushing. Um, we're now we're talking safety and we're in an equally bad situation. So my my question, I guess, that I pose is not not to you but to to us. What's the proper course of action when, when there's a concern to get these things communicated and addressed, communicated to the right people so that they can be addressed? Um, I think that's something that, we, that's an issue that we need to, to take on and, and maybe pretty quickly because these things seem to be becoming more and more common and especially with elementary school and even middle school uh, students, things can spiral out of control if they, feel a little bit of freedom, mm -hmm. um, it could go pretty fast. So I guess that's my question. That's my response. I didn't want to just let you walk away and mm -hmm. feel like, well, I said my piece, let's see what happens. I mean, we're, we're aware and sensitive mm -hmm. to it. And I think there are some things that we could do. And that's just me. Anybody else wants to say something, please feel free. Well, I'd just like to add uh, that, uh, that um, you know, given that we have the school district we have multiple players involved with the buses, right? We have uh, CMD, we have uh, the principals, we have uh, Mr. Nestor, um, uh, and all play a part. Um, and so, so I think that it would be useful to, uh, for us internally to, to make clear where the, to your point, Matt, uh, make clear what you do when a parent calls, whomever they call. Right, so I don't like hearing, oh, I called CMD and they said it's the school district, and I called the school district and they said it was CMD. Um, uh, and I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm not criticizing the school district when I say that. I'm just saying that uh, we need to be clear about who is responsible for what and, make, and, and then communicate that back to the parents so that they feel as if somebody is taking responsibility for issues, because there are always going to be issues. Uh, the question is, how do we handle them? Um, and what do we do about them? If we have a driver shortage, um, uh, well, that, that's a sticky situation. But we can also communicate that to our parents so that at least they understand that we're trying to address it or what we're trying to do to address it. And I, I would just like to see a little bit more proactivity along those lines um, uh, rather than reactivity. Uh, so those, that's, that's my thoughts on this uh, as well. And. Uh, um, we all have kids. Most of us here on this board have kids in this district that ride the buses. Um, uh, you know, we all want safety to be. Uh, we we all agree that safety is a, a a premier concern as it relates to the buses. And I apologize on behalf of the district for the issues that you faced over the last uh, few days. And I'm certain we're going to address them appropriately.
Thank you. It wasn't over. This whole thing started on September 20th when there, an incident occurred between my, one of my sons and another boy. I called CMD around 4.30 on a Wednesday afternoon and told them what I heard from my two sons happened. And I asked to be the video. They told me I couldn't. Um, I'm not sure who I spoke with. It was a woman. Um, she said that somebody from the administration would view it. I called back Monday morning when I hadn't heard anything. And I spoke with Brian. He said he would go view the video. I called back two and a half hours later, and he still hadn't viewed it. It wasn't until I said that I have pictures of the bruises my son came home with on his shins that he went and would view it because I said I would involve the police if something wasn't done. And that's what started this thing, and then everything just kept escalating. And I understand there's problem, I don't want to say problem children, I understand there's issues with certain students, and if my kids are issues, I want to know about it, but I was told by the woman at CMD that the parents are not always notified when something happens on the bus. And that's the first problem. A parent should, a parent should always be notified if there's a problem on the bus. If my kid does something, if my kid kicks someone, I want to know. I want to be able to handle that at home as well as have, have that handled from CMD or the school. Dave, I just have a question. When it comes to incidences like this, does CMD or your office have any like incident report as in to go through the checks and balances to make sure everything's been checked off? What, what the, each of the drivers are, are given the ability to uh, produce referral slips. Uh, the bus drivers will not uh, meet out any discipline for any infractions that take place on the bus other than possibly moving the child to a, to a different seat or something like that. Um, the, the referral slips are sent to the building principal or uh, the assistant principal depending on who handles the discipline in each given building. And, and they're the people who will determine if there's any, uh, what, what the appropriate measures are for disciplining the student. Um, but, um, you know, one of, one of the challenges on a school bus is the driver's focus needs to be forward for the safety of all the children. So a lot of times things can happen behind them that they're not aware of what happened because um, they can't take their eyes off the road. Um, so, um, I think I think we've had some pretty good dialogue in the last couple uh, last week or so, back and forth. But tonight I heard some things that I hadn't heard before, not about your bus, but about some other things. And um, you know, it's hard to address things if you're not aware of them. So I would encourage people to communicate. Uh, routine things should go to CMD. Things that aren't answered promptly should come to me and or the, the building principal to, to try and uh, get the appropriate attention to, to those items. Um, but the bus drivers would, re, would communicate things that they're aware of to the buildings. Respectfully, Mr. Nestor, I, I think there might be a different way to go. Um, at the end of the day, CMD is not responsible to the parents of this district. They're not, they're not accountable, they're not hired. They are hired by us, the district. So I don't think that their first course of action should be to CMD. I think the first course of action, my opinion, if we were going to make a policy going forward, my opinion would be that the first person that parents should talk to would be the principal at their school, since that's the person with whom they should have the some semblance of a personal relationship anyway, who might know your child personally and might be able to say, oh, I know what happened or whatever. That's, that's what I would think would make the most sense. That person knows who to call at CMD, that person knows who to call here at the district, Mr. Nestor, and, and to get the additional information so that they can be that face representing you and your child to the people that have to make the decision. So there's no who shot John where you get the CMD saying it's the district's fault, the district saying it's CMD's fault. You get the principal saying, I want to take care of this kid and l answer this lady. Does that make sense? Yes. I think, I think that would be my recommendation on how we do this. Um, I, 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 I don't want to get it further into it than that, um, but there needs to be a way of having a reporting so that the, a lot of these things aren't being done, either on, on a building level or a bus level. We need to get uh, 
a, a sort of a uniform thing. For example, in our in our uh, packets, we get every month a number of how many students are in what uh, in in what grade and whether they're special or gifted or or what whatnot. So we have just an idea. It's just it's a snapshot. It's not all the information. It's not how they're doing. It's not you know successes and failures. It's just a snapshot of numbers of things. I think we could do the same thing with instance. Are the inst are there instances happening? Are they being resolved at the lowest level? You know what what had to be escalated. It's very very simple snapshot. I, I mean. It is not my job, it is not my intention to create a bunch of meaningless reports that you guys have to chase around data on, but something like this, where we, we talk about safety, we talked about safety not uh, with the children on the bus, but people not paying attention maybe to some of the stopping on the, you know, it's something we take very seriously. I think that's a way that we can do it, but for right now, what I, what I would like to see is if we have concurrence amongst the people on the board here, that the first person that parents should contact would be the principal of the uh, of the student uh, I couldn't have said that better Bob you you, you read my mind <laughs> I agree um, and, and I would just say unless uh, dr. Shirk and mr. Nestor or anybody want to you know make a, a good case to convince us otherwise that's right that's exactly how I think it should be but well I would agree too but I just want to add that that no matter what we say as to who should be the first person to be contacted, Mr. Nestor will still get calls. Um, uh, Dr. Shirk, you may get calls. Um, I may get calls um, or emails, um, uh, as well as the principals, as well as CMD. So everybody needs to be on the same page about what to say in, uh, if they're the first person to get the call. And the only thing I would just say is what I don't like us doing is saying you need to call the principal, even though that is the right thing. So um, uh, if somebody has gone to the trouble of calling me, then I don't say you need to call the principal. I get the information and, and I pass it on to the principal uh, with the permission of the person who gave me the call. Now, we, th this is an, we can discuss this in more detail. I just point out that when you pass people around from place to place, sometimes they feel lost in the process. So I just want to add that caution um, and make sure we think that through as well. But for sure, everybody needs to know what they're supposed to say because they're all going to get calls no matter what we tell them to do. The principal is the person who's ultimately responsible for resolving the problem. That's what we're saying here, right? It's the no. The person is the advocate for the student. That the the person who's responsible for solving the problem is ultimately Dr. Shirk. Well, okay, but, uh, uh, but the the not, principal of the, time the, the principal, principal is, is be... looking out for the needs of the student and the safety of the student. Dr. Shirk is looking at the policy of CMD, the responsibility of whether or not they're meeting their contractual obligations, whether they're doing it in a timely fashion, and how the, how the issue ties into discipline. It, it's, it's a more encompassing thing than just taking care of this one issue. I want the principal focused on the student and focusing on solving that issue. Um, so I, you're, you, I understand what you're saying. Not everybody's going to get the message. People are going to call who they call. And yes, we can establish what the parameters are and how that information gets relayed, but I, you know, Again, I'm not going to get into moving school buses here. I've, I've given you basically my vision of what I think needs to be done, and I trust you to implement that vision. The only thing I disagree with Mr. Rabinowitz on is if we're approached by a parent regarding a bus issue or any other issue. I think our stance, whether it be via Facebook or direct contact to us um, or to anybody, really, um, that's above the chain of command, is did you follow the chain of command? Go to your teacher, go to your principal, so you're not satisfied, go to the superintendent, you're not satisfied, then come to the board. So, and I agree with what, what Bob's saying in regards to the, and Matt, in regards to the principal being the, the key person, right? I'm just concerned about the precedent we're setting here tonight, because basically what we've done is heard from a parent who, if she followed the chain of command, this was the right place to come. but. We just overrode our administration with this issue. And that's a concern that I have. It should always go through. Now, if she already went through the principal, went through the superintendent, then come to the school board. But we shouldn't be hearing from, you know, because they knew to come to this meeting, well, let's override the superintendent. That's what we hired him to do. 
So I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with the the steps you know that you're suggesting, Bob, and and perhaps that's what Bill's going to agree with. But it should always go through the these type of things should go through the chain of command. Is is uh, and just let me add one issue while I have the mic, if I can. We need to, and, and I would request that we're not, we don't do it here, but send back to the administration to get a clear uh, protocol on communication in regards to bus issues. We, this was kind of touched on lightly, but this has been an issue in, in the recent past. When do parents get called? Well, just my opinion, right? If there's first responders involved, police, ambulance, fire, whatever, that should be a call. If it's more than whatever minutes late, they should get a call. You know, when else should they get a call? Because parents sometimes are getting calls for maybe minor things, and then they're not getting calls for other things. So I would ask that the administration uh, look at that piece as well, as far as when the, what do you call it, global messenger is used. Hi. Um, so I had a far less. Jamie O'Keefe. Um, thank you, Mr. Nestor, for helping me out on this. There is no chain of command, right? So, I mean, that's your first problem, right? I, so I had a challenge with, with my daughter's bus. It's still ongoing, but it seems to be under control. Far less issues. It was, it was consistently showing up late. You go to the PGSD website, it says call to CMD. That's all it says. Like, it took me two weeks of five parents to figure out that Mr. Nestor existed. Right, and there were phone calls to principals, there were phone calls to CMD. I called CMD personally five times. Right, all I wanted was, can we pick up my kids five minutes earlier because they're getting to school at 9 a.m. There's no chain of command at all. So, I mean, that's the first thing that needs to be established and communicated. I honestly don't care what it is and who it needs to go to. I think giving it to the vendor is a bad idea. Right, I'm in a service business, you would never put that, that process and that control on a vendor. But, you know, if that's what it is, find them, you know, build your controls in from there or build an escalation process. But that's got to get communicated out because it does go to Facebook to find out what, who I, that's how I found out that, that Mr. Nestor existed. I was reading all the other posts and it's like, oh, there's a guy that's in charge of transportation. Great, I'm going to send him an email. And he was immediately, got right back to me and, and responded again this morning. And, you know, hopefully things are going to get worked out in the next couple of days. But there's no... There's no plan for that right now, and there's no ability to understand who that is, and you do get a consistent. I got it for four days of, nope, not my problem, go call this person. And then that person says, go call somebody else, or basically just says, call CMD back again. So I agree, once you decide what that chain of command is, you should enforce that. I understand the thought process of, hey, somebody shouldn't communicate again, but you're just gonna continue the problem, so you need to push it back down to it, and then follow up and make sure that it got done. But you gotta Coming out of this meeting, I still don't know what the change is. You know, and I don't know the resolution. I don't think you're going to get a resolution at this meeting. What we're asking the administration to do is go back and formulate that chain of command and that resolution, and then we'll communicate it back. Well, well, let's make sure that we also get it on the website, whatever we decide, um, a very clear procedure um, at the very least. So, so that if a person does the right thing and goes to the website, it doesn't just say call CMD um, uh, as, your, uh, as your first response when that isn't really what we want you to do. Could we put out a district-wide communication pointing the parents in the right direction to, you know, if there is a bus issue, please, you know, call your principal, um, you know, and give them what right now could be the chain of command because that's, that's what they're looking for right now. They want to walk away knowing that the next time there's an issue, they can call this number and they will speak to someone who will then push it forward and either try to resolve it or send it on to the next step. So I, I don't think they've gotten that answer yet. Well, so I mean, I'm okay if it's, we're going to communicate that next week once, once we figure it out. I just want to understand how that's going to be right, in some relative time. I'm not advocating doing a, a snap decision right now on something like this. Uh, can, can I just say something? Uh, on our website, under the transportation tab, it has my picture and my phone number and my email address. Um, so I don't know how where, where, where you were going to look, but it, it, it's there. Uh, I just double-checked to make sure that it was still there. Uh, um, so 
you know, we, if we want to change that to contact your building principal with all issues, uh, we can do that. But I think the building principal is probably more more related to uh, safety and discipline issues, whereas the routing issues are the things that I would typically deal with with CMD. Well, that may be a perfect thing to say, right, yeah. um, when we figure this out. Right. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Mr. Nestor. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you coming in. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, ch our, our children of our element, you are the advocate for your child. I get that. And they're going to come home to you, and they're going to tell you about their day and what happened. And, and that's where, you know, and, and, and just, you know, agreeing with Mr. Ligman, because the, the protocols that, 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 that we follow, and obviously you're, it's not written down, okay, specifically. But, you know, some of our concerns, if, if I chronologically look at this thing, we had a two, two first weeks of school. That's usually a little chaotic, chaotic with schedules and so forth and so on. That, that's just standard operating procedure. We get into week three, we still have some more schedule issues. Week four, we have some schedule issues. We talk to CMD. They have some, obviously, some, some concerns about their, they don't have enough drivers. They're, they have drivers in the pipeline. They're trying to get it done. And at the same time, I know Mr. Nestor and CMD is trying to do reroutes to, to, to try to squeeze routes down and get people where they need, need to be. I, I know that is a fact, and I know Mr. Nestor has addressed every, every logistical standpoint of that, and I know our building principles address all the discipline pieces as well. So what I'm hearing tonight from the board and from the community is we just need to do a better job with that, okay? Our principles do react to those things at a building level. I, they, they, we, I want, you need to tell them, and you need to make sure that they follow through, and if they don't, then we have Dr. Harney to go to next, and then finally here, and then, you know, my hope is that this thing gets nailed, nailed down at the building level. Uh, so, um, yes, I am concerned about it, um, and I know CMD is concerned about it because we, we contact them every day. So we, we will put some clear, clear focus items on the website. We'll, we can send a global connect out where we can have these procedures in place, the logistical piece, the, the route piece, I know Mr. Nestor will handle the discipline on a daily basis. And one of the things I know for sure is that I've talked to uh, my, my three, five principals and my middle school principal is that we have handled more bus referrals in the month of September than, than ever before because we've made an area of focus with our, 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 uh, our, our building principals of making sure we follow through regarding our discipline and attendance. And riding a bus is a privilege. Okay, and, and there are certain parameters, unfortunately for us, we have to follow when it comes to smaller children, you know, and we have to try to educate those ki kids to do better. And then there's other sometimes limitations where we have to work within the constraints, you know, of an IEP. So we are aware of all that. Uh, I hear you loud and clear. Like I said, I hear the board, uh, I hear the community. We'll do, we'll continue to work on this and get better. And uh, it's not because, um, no one cares and no one's turning. I, I understand uh, that what my uh, lower Podgrove staff is doing with Mrs. Williams and Mr. Seiler. I know Mr. Boyer and Mr. Becker are handling this like on, on lickety split because that was a focus for us as a school district. That was an area of concern coming out of last year and we didn't, we wanted to make sure we got out of the gate. Some of the CMD issues, I, we, we just, some of that we just could not control, and, but they are working on that. And we obviously are going to ask them to to make sure that they continue to do their, their part so that these issues, you know, get resolved. The five, ten minutes here, whether it's before school or after school. So um, we'll, we'll get that out sooner than later. And, uh, and, I, and I always say this, and I've said this to everybody, some people here because I've been in their classrooms and I've been in the buildings. We are a small enough, intimate district. Call me. Okay? I mean, I just, it's, we, we don't have 10,000, 12,000 kids. We don't have over a thousand employees, okay? Uh, people do call me, people do stop by my office, uh, and obviously, uh, when it gets to a certain point, then you need to do that. I can't do district business on Facebook. I can't, because we have to be thoughtful in the way we do things. I can't, I can't react in, in seconds and minutes. You know, uh, I, I need to make sure that we process and make the right decisions for our children. So. Don't, you know, forgive me for that, I guess, but uh, I, uh, we are intimate and small enough that we can help you out in a short term 
because it can flow. Instead of going this way, it goes that way, and sometimes going that way is a lot quicker than going this way. So uh, I, I, I give that as a final option. But we do have administrators and, and, and our business manager of transportation who are capable of getting the job done. And um, I only ask that if it's not getting done, then you just call me immediately and we'll, we'll cut out all the middle people. That's, you know, we can do that. Okay? So I appreciate your insight and thanks for coming. Um, I have a question, Mr. Nestor. We recently reapproved a contract with the CMD. Does, is it stand or is it in the contract anywhere about um, regulations or guidelines as far as that they will always have a certain number of drivers on staff or performance of the drivers? Because one thing I was going to bring to you after the meeting, but I'll just mention now is um, coming home from work the other night, uh, practice bus went by me and they were turning through an intersection and I looked up and I saw oh, a pot scrap, it's one of ours, and there was a student standing right behind the bus driver talking to the bus driver. So obviously that driver was okay with that. So I just wondering, I mean, do we have any recourse with CMD for whenever their drivers are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and keeping our children safe? If we become aware of a, of a situation uh, I have that conversation with Brian or his superior if it if it's not taken care of uh, at CMD. Uh, to date, we've had very good response when we when we bring issues to them. Um, as far as the number of uh, mandated drivers, uh, there I don't believe there is anything that's specified in the contract. Um, they know how many drivers they need. We had an unexpected turnover at, right at the beginning of the school year this year. Um, that uh, un unfortunately it impacted, uh, you know, we lost, I think they lost five drivers. Uh, we have about 40 vehicles on the road every day, so that's about 12% of our staff uh, left in the first couple weeks of school. Uh, so, and, and unfortunately it takes, it takes a while for them to onboard new drivers to get all the clearances and things like that. So I know they've been in that process. They have some people in the pipeline that are coming on, which will hopefully relieve this, pre this pressure that we have on our, on our, uh, uh, on our routes, which require uh, sub-drivers on, on some of the runs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we can certainly look at putting something quota in a, in a future contract, uh, but I don't think it's there. Um, but we've been we've had very good response from CMD when we when we bring an issue that we have uh, found with the driver to their attention, or if they you know, a lot of times they find they find the issue and they address it, you know, in advance. It's not just us bringing it to them. To piggyback off of discussion from tonight from Mr. Lingruns, obviously Mr. Lapik and such like that, other companies that again would have more issues with me or more determination whether than just dollars. So I would ask that also to be taken into factor over the course of the year. I don't think that we uh, asked the uh, uh, administration to evaluate CMD. I think we asked the administration to evaluate whether or not uh, we want to continue with the model in which uh, we don't in which we own the buses um, and the bus company um, uh, doesn't own the buses. I believe that was the subject of our discussion at the last board meeting. Um, does anybody uh, recollect that? That's going to include evaluating CMD in general. I, I want to be clear about what our direction was. Our direction was to evaluate whether or not um, uh, uh, what the question of ownership of the buses. Um, uh, I, not evaluation I thought, of our I thought vendor. our my directive was to find out whether it was a fiscally sound practice correct that we're we're involved in um, the the items that you're talking about mr. leach uh, may bring some degree of subjectivity into the in the discussion maybe maybe I can get the data maybe I can I don't know I don't know how much of that type of data I can get let me just say is to my knowledge you're the only district, and it's been this way for, I won't tell you how long, um, that has this model, so it's going to be very hard to compare, meaning the model, we own the buses and somebody operates them. Uh, you're the only ones that I'm aware of anywhere in the state, but certainly this part of the state that has that model, so I just caution you. And the other thing I'll tell you that, uh, and this is not a legal opinion or legal advice, just from uh, attending other board meetings and 
based on discussion with some of my colleagues who also represent public school districts. Unfortunately, the issue of drivers is not at all unique to this district, and I know a district that's not too far away that's talking about defaulting their operator, not because they, they don't have the right number of drivers, but because they're not providing the service. That's really the bottom line. The problem is <laughs> there's nobody else that can pick the service up, uh, you know, who can start to provide 40 and 50 bus drivers or buses. So I only give you that not as a legal opinion, only to the fact that the issue is unfortunately uh, become fairly significant all over southeast Pennsylvania, as I understand it. Uh, I, I don't know there's any consolation in misery loves company, but you do have company. So for, for purposes of clarification, for the news story that I somehow suspect will appear tomorrow, <laughs> are we asking people to call the principals? Joe, we always have. That's, al that, that's always been... Yeah, yeah. That we, that's always been as long as I've been in this business. We've 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 done we've we've asked that now. If uh, and again, this is this is cropped up. So you know, we didn't hear about this for four years prior to these concerns, so to speak. This specific that we didn't hear. So so we're gonna we're gonna go back out and uh, you know we have administrative meetings tomorrow. We're gonna just uh, up that protocol and have an understanding that logistically. You know, we went to logistic calls to go to Mr. Nestor, and we went to building specific things, uh, discipline and safety. We want that reported, you know, to, uh, to our building principals, uh, you know, for, for our parents. You know, a lot of times in middle school and high school, there's self-advocacy. They'll, they'll, they'll tell counselors and building principals that things, but obviously in our elementary divisions, you know, we would expect the parents would be self-advocates uh, for their kids and get that information, you know, to the, to the principals. Um, so um, that's just some, that's going to be like a refocus, if you will, a repoint of emphasis, so that our, our community and our families know uh, who they need to contact, and then then we go to CMD for bus tapes or logistical is things, and they help us in in, in that particular end uh, as well. Thank you. Yep, yeah, you bet. Okay. Um. I have uh, John Rossi. If it's getting late, I'll make this short. Is this the one? Battery, battery mine. I'll speak louder. I'll make this short, to blunt to the point. First of all, last the board. We have we've been talking about protocols and procedures most of the night, correct? Do we have a protocol and a procedure on public comment, Mr. President? Do we? Yes or no? I'm not. Hold on. I'm, I'm a little annoyed. But you all just set a precedent tonight. Do you let a gentleman with a concern come out of the audience and stand behind somebody who was speaking about a subject in public comment out of turn? And you guys just let him come up. I'm not against the person who did it. That shouldn't have happened. You have other people who have public comment. You just set a precedent. Anybody can step up, stand behind this lady who was talking about her concern. And this gentleman came up, stood up, grabbed the mic, and started talking about, raising his hand, started talking about his concern. It's not how it works, right? Well, we also have a policy that you're not allowed to direct questions to particular members of the board, but I'm letting you do that now, okay. Mr. Ross. As a board, I'm sorry, I apologize. I know if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. We try to be considerate to our audience. We do have policies, we do have protocols and procedures, but we try to be considerate to our audience and our constituents. Now, the second question. The reason I didn't come here tonight is about the bus issue. Um, Mr. Nestor, you stated that uh, the bus driver is not supposed to be handed out discipline or whatever you call it, and they send off the My daughter spends the afternoon after school, she goes back to tech school, she gets tutored because she's not the greatest student in the world, she's trying real hard. Her and her friend are getting tutored after school, and apparently they have to get a, uh, a pass from either the tutor or the school to get on that, I guess, activity bus. And that activity bus takes them from the high school, I guess, to the middle school. They switch buses and they come home or they stay on the bus to pick up more kids. I'm not sure how that works. I think it's the opposite direction, but. She got, they went to get on the bus at the high school. They both had a pass. This is bus seven, just so you know. Both had a pass. 
The other girl's rumbling through her purse, her, her satchel, whatever you want to call it, to get, find her pass. My daughter drops hers. She goes to pick it over, pick it up. The other girl goes to help her. He automatically accuses them of only having one pass, and they were trying to switch it off. And he screamed at them both and told them to get off the bus. He wasn't taken. Well, stick up with my daughter, and both of them did not, both did not get off the bus. Because they had to get home. They, they rode in the bus to the next, wherever the transfer, went. however they do it, I don't know what they do. But she was very upset. Very upset that she got yelled at and screamed at by the bus driver. And they were told to get off the bus. Now, I don't, he said he was going to write up something, tell them whatever. I haven't heard anything about it. I don't know if that can be followed up on. Find out. But, you know, real quickly, our bus drivers are there. I think he said they look, he said they drive, they look forward, they're driving, that's their job. And they have a heck of a responsibility. I'm not diminishing that by any means. But their biggest responsibility is our children. And I don't think our children should be afraid or nervous about the bus driver. Been in this district since 2000. For the longest time I was spoiled, we had a great bus driver down on Foxtail Drive. And never really had too much of an issue. They'd have the issue here and there about, well, it's not our problem, you call that. And those buses say Foxgrove, like Mr. Lincoln said. We're ultimately responsible. Because that, that bus says Potts Grove School District. I bet you a third of the people in this district don't know. Do not know that we don't own and operate our own bus. The bus says Potts Grove on the side. So, huh? I mean, we don't operate them. I'm sorry, we don't operate the buses. And, and that was a big concern. And when she told me that, she was in 12th grade. And she got screamed at by the bus driver. Do we have cameras in all our buses? No. In our big buses. So we should be able to look back at things. And be, are we allowed to request that as a parent or not? If, if there's an issue of concern on the bus, you can contact me and I can get the tape pulled or you can contact yeah. CMD and have the tape pulled. Uh, we, we don't allow parents to view the tapes because sure. there's other students on the bus. Absolutely correct. I, I agree with that 100%. My last question, I'll make it real quick couple issues, and I, I love it when the board doesn't go straight nine to nothing, everything passes happy. I like it when people have their opinions and their and, and their and their, their no's and their yes. And most of the time, they'll explain why you voted no. Are we allowed to ask on certain issues why certain why votes were no, or is that a no? There was there was a vote tonight on supporting a group. Uh, a student, and I'd like to know why those people said no. I'd say you're allowed to ask. I don't think anybody's, nobody's obligated to answer you, but you're always allowed to ask. I'd just like to know why there was no votes on supporting a student group, that's all. If they want to put it out there, fine, I guess. Are there any other no voters want to put out why they voted no? I'd appreciate it. Well, you asked your question, John. Let me just reiterate at the, at the risk of being hooted down and booed by the audience, uh, that this is a time of public comment. As Mr. Alexander pointed out, uh, we're to accept comment. It's not necessarily meant for uh, the board to be cross-examined, so I'm going to ask that if you have those questions, you address that to the people Somebody personally. Died. So, Anybody else? I get it. That's all I have for public comment. Um, I always check one time. Is, does anybody have public comment that did not fill out a, a form? All right, with that then we will adjourn the meeting. Thanks everybody for coming tonight.